Hello, and thank you to everyone who's joined us today for today's session. Uh, it's now the top of the hour, so we will begin. I want to make sure that everyone uh, can, in fact, hear us before we get started. Uh, so this is also a way for you to get familiar with the GoTo training interface, the control panel in front of you. Um, if you can, in fact, hear me loud and clear, if you can please just raise your hand or let us know via chat. That'll give us a sense that you can, in fact, hear us um, before we jump into the content. So I see number of hands going up. Wonderful, wonderful. For many of you, this has become old hat. I see many familiar uh, uh, names of folks who've joined us for previous webinars brought to you by the Association of Moving Image Archivists. So it looks as if um, people can hear us. Thank you for letting us know. Um, and we are now going to get started. So if you were able to find the hand icon in your control panel, then you'll probably also be able to locate the chat window, which is at the bottom of the control panel. You have all joined today in a listen-only mode, but that doesn't mean that we don't want to hear you. So please be sure to communicate with us. Send along your questions and comments if you're encountering any issues during the webinar. Please let us know. You can uh, either let the entire group know, then choose all, or just to the organizers. Okay, so uh, officially I'd like to welcome you to our fifth webinar in the series of digital topics brought to you by EMEA. I'm Kimberly Tarr and I'm going to serve as the webinar producer for this session. Um, and I'm, I'm talking to you all from New York City today. Um, I looked at the list. It looks like we have folks joining us from around the world. So those of you uh, on the West Coast, good morning. Here on the East Coast, Good afternoon and good evening to those of you who are, are joining us from Europe. So we have a wonderful session in store for you. As I mentioned, this is the fifth of uh, eight webinars dealing with digital topics. Today is the second of two webinars dealing specifically with video. Uh, on Wednesday, we had a session brought to you by Kate Murray and Jim Holm dealing with video file format. And today we're going to talk about video digitization. I'm delighted uh, that Peter Alexic is on the line with us, also from uh, New York City. And uh, I want to make, make sure that we have as much time today for him to cover the material uh, that he has in store for you, but also ensure that we have time to answer and address your questions. So what I'd like to do uh, is, before I turn it over to Peter, I want to point out to you that this session is being recorded, um, and the video will be available um, subsequent to today's session. So you will get an email from the Association of Moving Image Archivists uh, office letting you know how to access that file. The materials that we're going to be referencing today are also going to be available for you. If you look in the control panel, there's a materials tab, and it either says materials or looks like a little piece of paper. If you click on that, there are two PDFs available. One is a presentation, and the other is a resources guide. There's also a frequently asked questions um, kind of go-to sheet in there as well if you're encountering any issues with the webinar. Um, it addresses a lot of technological questions if you have trouble with the audio, et cetera. So, um, so thanks for everyone. We have a record number of participants today, um, and Peter Alexic will be talking about video digitization. I'll give you a little bit of background on Peter, and then I'll turn it over to him. So Peter Alexic is the Assistant Media Conservator at the Museum of Modern Art. He received his Bachelor of Arts in Cinema Studies from the University of Southern California and his MA from NYU's Moving Image Archiving and Preservation Program where he's currently an adjunct professor teaching the video preservation course. Peter's other projects include the Fugazi Live series, which makes accessible the band's entire live performances, as well as numerous projects working with independent artists and musicians to preserve their audiovisual material. So thanks so much, Peter, and welcome. 
Thanks, Kim. Um, yeah, so this is, apologize everyone, this is a little new for me, so if there's any awkward pauses, um, please bear with me. Um, and I just wanted to say at the outset that I will also be um, looking at the chat window, so please, as I'm going along, feel free to ask questions, uh, clarification, et cetera, and I'll just kind of monitor that um, and field your questions uh, as I'm going. Uh, so just real quick, um, much as Kim did, I just like want to make sure that everybody is hearing me okay, everything's, um, you know, orally looked, sounding good. So if you could raise your hands. Great. Okay. So let's get started. So as Kim said, um, I'm an assistant media conservator at the Museum of Modern Art, um, and I also teach uh, video preservation um, at the Moving Image Archiving and Preservation course at NYU. Um, and actually, a lot of the topics that we'll be covering today, I teach to my students. Um, so hopefully, um, I will have something uh, knowledgeable to say and impart to all of you. So, and I also want to give a huge thanks to Jim Hone and uh, Kim Tarr, who is serving as producer for this and helping in putting this presentation together. Um, and I should also say that um, if many of you attended the presentation on Wednesday, what a lot of the stuff we'll talk about um, today is going to be about the analog to digital migration process. Um, however, I'll address kind of target files and things like that, uh, but I won't go into much detail. Um, Kate and Jim on Wednesday covered a lot of that about um, digital file formats, um, characteristics of um, digital files. Um, so hopefully this will kind of give you a um, prequel, if you will, to that presentation. So what we'll be covering today is um, the needs and requirements of digitization. Um, so basically, um, the aim of this webinar is really just you have, um, you know, in your collection just stacks and stacks of magnetic media. Um, and as we're all well aware, this material is rapidly degrading, um, coupled with the fact that it is tied to an industry where obsolescence is um, uh, the name of the game. So um, we're kind of in a race against time to get this material off of those carriers and migrate it to other carriers um, for future access and preservation. Um, so at the outset, we're just going to talk about kind of the background of the the information that you're going to need to gather, the staffing and budgeting that you're going to need to do before even thinking about um, going along this road of video digitization. And then we'll kind of break it down in terms of um, in terms of that information that you want to gather, the metadata capture um, to kind of, in a granular sense, um, look at different aspects um, or different um, types of metadata that you're going to want to gather about that analog material um, before you then go on to um, your migration process, be it in-house or vendor. Um, we'll then talk about kind of once you have intellectual control of your collection, how you can then inspect that material to see if it's actually um, able to be digitized or not, or if it will need to be um, conserved in some way or um, treated in some way. Um, and then we'll go into kind of in-house migration. So there's kind of two ways you can go about migrating this material. Um, you can do it um, totally within your institution or archive, um, or you can send this material out. And we'll kind of weigh the pros and cons. Um, and really within the in-house migration is I'm going to kind of go into what is analog video, what are the key things you need to know, um, which will also carry into the vendor migration. I'll kind of make that, that link. Um, and finally, um, we'll talk about QA and QC procedures, and I see there's a question here, um, that QC is quality control and QA is quality assurance. And we'll get into um, kind of why we differentiate between those, what those are at the end of this presentation. Um, so yeah. So let's get started. So the first thing you're going to want to really consider um, before attempting anything of this nature is you want to get intellectual control of your collection. Um, and what this constitutes is essentially a collection assessment. Um, uh, there's a great paper called uh, More Product, Less Process um, that uh, I think Josh Ranger at um, AV Preserve has kind of updated in a blog post to, to make it about um, uh, audiovisual material, but it's really just, and I know working in institutions that you, there's just a mountain of material to go through and you don't know how to approach this material. But this is really the first kind of critical step that will really speak towards whether you go with a vendor, you do it in-house, um, and really give you as much um, 
information and, and, and analysis uh, to make sure that you're not doing this um, in a foolhardy manner, that it's going to be a really considered um, and successful preservation migration uh, workflow for this material. Um, so along with this, you're going to want to establish a selection pr criteria. And what this means is you're going to want to, and this is kind of um, underneath there, um, Basically, within your institution, select the material that you want to um, preserve or migrate to another carrier. Um, and things to consider are content. You know, is this material of significant cultural um, relevance? Uh, is it relevant to your institution? Um, are there researchers who are looking to access ma this material um, uh, uh, readily, or is it, is it constantly being requested? Um, is this material unique? Do you have the only copy of, of this thing? Um, and then finally, kind of in what is kind of really leading the charge in these kind of um, workflows and preser preservation pipelines is media degradation. Um, and degradation and obsolescence are kind of hand in hand, um, where you know analog media, and I'll get into this later, analog magnetic media, I should say, um, in itself has, it degrades. Um, it, it will it will fail over time. It will um, break down. Um, but before that even happens, you may lose the ability to actually play back or access that material. So stepping back. Um, before you kind of do a collection assessment um, and look at your collection and kind of the magnetic material in your collection, you first want to ask yourself what type of institution you are because this is going to guide a lot of uh, your planning um, and a lot of, it, it will give you definitions um, and answers to questions that will come along later on. Um, so once you've, you've, and this should be a pretty easy one to figure out, um, but, and I'm just going to reference MoMA just because that's um, what I know the best, but, you know, we're a museum, and so we're, um, our mission is to uh, care for modern, um, modern art of, to, um, apologies, modern art uh, to the highest standard possible um, within our collection. And so that's within our mission. So anything, and because I'm in the conservation department, I am dealing with a collection of modern art, and I have to conserve this um, using best practices to the highest order. Um, at an archive, however, um, not that I'm saying that you need to not um, address this material in the same way, but your mission may be different. You may be serving a different public. Um, it may be just for institutional documentation. Um, it could be an archive, uh, business archive, where you just need to make this material accessible um, uh, within the institution itself. So you really need to ask yourself those questions before going about these things, because you may not need to um, you know, spend the time really uh, bringing a tape back together when it's not going to serve the purposes of your institution. Um, and then kind of right under that is staffing. And staffing is critical um, in all of this because you need the proper amount of um, uh, staff just in terms of man hours but also in terms of knowledge. Um, so you need someone that has a familiarity with audiovisual material. Um, and then as I go along in this presentation, how to um, basically speak the language of, of um, audiovisual migration to vendors um, or to contractors who are building a, um, setups for you in-house. Um, and by no means am I saying these people have to be um, experts working in the field for their years, um, but just conversant um, in the kind of terminology and rhetoric that um, comes with this type of material. And then, okay, finally, um, and this is huge um, for all audiovisual preservation um, moving forward is IT. Um, you need to know, um, become friends with, um, and really uh, work together well with your IT department because um, what you're going to be gathering is a ton of digital material. Um, and as I kind of mentioned that, you know, with analog material, this stuff will degrade and obsolescence. It only speeds up with digital material. So there's going to be a lot of, you're going to be creating a lot of um, digital material to be stored, but this material is going to need to be actively monitored and migrated. And with this kind of material is, in, in some ways, as I found, a, you just have to kind of work with your IT 
um, department to kind of shift their frame of reference because they're used to kind of, um, I want to say a business approach, but more of a um, protecting information from an, from an institutional standpoint, and you're approaching this for as um, cultural heritage. And so this material needs different things from IT, so it's great you need to start developing those relationships, understand your digital storage infrastructure, um, and then basically that'll, that's going to help you immensely down the line. So as I said, the first kind of step is an analysis of your collection. And the one that I can recommend the most, and I know this is the most time consuming, is an item level inventory of everything, you know, of, of a magnetic media, um, specifically video, um, which is um, the topic of this webinar, um, nature. Um, and what that means is you want to gather as much information about that material as possible. And as it's listed here, you also want to gather stock lengths and content durations to determine aggregate transfer times and storage needs. Um, what to define those is durations are if you say, for example, have a VHS tape and on the label it says, um, you know, recording of a rehearsal uh, 15 minutes. You can, you know, assume with a good amount of certainty that the content on there is going to be about 15 minutes. In addition to that, you also want to want record the stock links, which are um, typically printed on all um, cassette-based uh, video magnetic material. Um, and then open reel material you can usually find um, either by measuring um, the hub of, of the magnetic reel um, or uh, it'll be listed on the box. And why this, is, and I should also mention in uh, the list of resources that uh, the uh, Texas Video Format Identification Guide is fantastic in terms of figuring out where all these things are on the cassettes, um, how to like identify what format is what, um, and really just kind of um, bring clarity to what your collection has within it. Um, but the reason for really gathering all this information is you can then take the, these stock links or content durations and analyze them to basically come up with a, how long it's going to take you um, to accomplish the migration of this material, um, and then B, potentially even more critical, how much storage you're going to need. So as I mentioned before, you know, you really need to be friendly and conversant with your IT staff. Um, this will give you a hard number that you can then communicate to your IT staff that either, you know, if you decide to go with a, a vendor migration, here is a lump sum of digital material that I'm going to be bringing into this institution. I need to care for it. Um, or it'll give you a projected growth of your collection, your digital collection over time. So you can say, you know, this is the collection. We've, we're going to parse it out into fours, for example. So you can kind of tell your IT staff um, how much you're going to grow so that they can properly plan for that and accommodate the material once you've finished these, these workflows. And then related to that, so once you have all this information about your collection, um, what you're then going to want to do is figure out if you have adequate staffing. Um, is it just you um, who's going to be carrying out this material? Because, because that's going to dictate um, kind of what path you take versus uh, vending this, this material out for migration or doing it in-house. Um, equally as important to this is also the funding available to you. Um, is this a one-time grant where you have to accomplish everything within a certain amount of time? Um, or is this um, a, uh, a, a rolling kind of budget that your institution has provided to you um, that will basically, um, your institution is supporting this over, um, you know, an extended period of time, so you can kind of plan with that, and that will kind of time tie directly into the time frame considerations, whether you need to, you have money for one year and you have to get everything done very quickly, um, or if you can extend this over time. So to kind of keep going with this information gathering, um, when you do the in inventory of your collection, I'm going to list off some kind of metadata um, requirements that you should consider and um, populate as you're um, doing this analysis and inventory of your magnetic 
uh, video material. So, and key to this is um, what, what is you have to kind of look institutionally and and look at what your current metadata capture and description is, because um, there are a lot of schemas out there. There's a lot of different um, ways of going about gathering and storing this information. Um, so you don't want to go about this kind of reinventing the wheel. Um, you really want to leverage your existing metadata systems um, and adapt them if they need to be for audiovisual material or if they already have that built into it, then kind of just tweak them or, you know, um, find areas where you can populate this information that I'm about to list. Um, speaking just from um, the perspective of MoMA, um, for the collection we use a system called uh, the Museum System or TMS. And so what we've done is adapted that um, to kind of fulfill the needs of collecting um, kind of the, the um, technical and descriptive metadata information um, about uh, magnetic media in our collection. So one type of uh, metadata that's um, really critical um, and is probably um, old hat to a lot of you is descriptive metadata. And some type, these are kind of, I'm sure, very familiar to you, but kind of the first key um, thing to gather and also assign uh, to your media, your item level uh, media carrier. Um, and so what you're going to be harvesting are things like title, if it's on the tape, you know, creator, what collection it comes from. Um, but this is when you start to basically start your chain of custody um, with uh, your um, your collection. Um, and I'll kind of keep talking about that because that's kind of a critical element of uh, this migration process is this chain of custody. And so where you kind of start that is by um, assigning that item a unique ID or UUID. Um, so what this will do is give you, you know, and, and each institution is different in assigning these, but it gives you control of what what that, that analog piece of media is and then will allow you to carry that forward um, in terms of when you migrate it, you may want to assign your files the same UUID to make that intellectual link. Um, but basically, it just allows you to kind of get um, real just control and, of, uh, and intellectual control of your collection. And then here, additional descriptive fields can include, you know, date of creation, place of creation, language, genre, abstract, um, contributor, et cetera. There's, um, numerous different fields um, uh, that you may want to populate depending on who you are, um, but it's just basically under kind of the uh, descriptive metadata umbrella, um, I would say the UUID is kind of the, the, the key thing to hit home on in terms of this section. So the next, and again, I mean, I don't mean to rank metadata here, uh, but uh, provenance is also um, incredibly important uh, for the migration process of this material. Um, and kind of sample provenance metadata fields are format. Um, so for example, is it VHS? Is it UMATIC? Is it one inch? Is it two inch? Um, gauge, uh, gauge is typically seen in kind of film uh, um, metadata schemas. Um, but it can also relate to, um, in analog uh, magnetic media, it's, you know, half inch, uh, quarter inch, uh, two inch, one inch, um, in terms of the, the real size. Um, length, um, and that has to do with kind of the duration of the content on the material, um, if it's available to you. Uh, the stock brand, um, many people think that this isn't, uh, that important to gather because it's just like, oh, it's all just tape. Um, but this is actually very uh, useful um, because uh, as um, people have been doing this, there's been a body of knowledge that's kind of happened organically um, through, you know, video engineers, uh, video transfer houses, et cetera, where certain um, stock brands from certain um, eras are known to be especially problematic. Um, just for instance, uh, the Ampex uh, audio tape uh, made in the early 1980s is just known to be um, prone to binder hydrolysis or sticky sedge um, syndrome. So this not only allows you to get, you know, just information about your collection, but it also can then be um, uh, conveyed to the vendor or whoever's going to be doing these migrations in-house. And basically, 
um, this will uh, allow them to basically assign things. Um, and yeah, I see the question here that it is technical metadata. Um, what we're we're making the difference in technical is coming up. The technical is going to be more about the file um, that is going to be derived from this material. So I completely understand your point. Um, and then finally is signal encoding. So it's basically, is it NTSC, PAL, CCAM? Um, for people who are not uh, familiar with uh, these terms, um, NTSC is the uh, North Amer American um, standard for video um, transmission. Um, and PAL is the European standard as well as CCAM. They kind of are from different regions. Um, the main difference between NTSC PAL slash CCAM is um, is the power, uh, the cycle power um, in each region in the U.S. is a 60 hertz cycle, um, and in Europe it's a 50 hertz cycle. And I'll explain more um, why that's important. But you want to make sure um, you want to record that information because you need to match uh, those standards to the VTRs or videotape recorders that you're going to be using down the line. Um, and then finally, markings on containers, any kind of um, information that is available in the container. This can be um, engineer log sheets um, that were typically like stuffed into the sleeve of the shell, um, or I'm sorry, the shell casing, um, or anything like that that kind of points to the origin of this analog material. And then uh, rights metadata, um, this is, you know, Basically, are you allowed um, to digitize this material? So just sample rights metadata, is, um, rights declarations, the rights holder name, their contact designation, their contact information. So this is basically figuring out if you have the ability to migrate this material or not. Um, structural uh, metadata, this is just to build um, relationships. And this is really comes into um, uh, I want to say relation, but it, it, it uh, comes into play when you have multi-part um, recordings. Uh, so you can have, you know, um, a three-part recording spread across three tapes. Um, and so this basically builds those links within um, your uh, cataloging system um, to say, you know, this UID is linked to these other two um, UIDs, be it VHS tapes or files, um, to kind of build um, the structure of the um, the, the content, um, right. and then technical metadata. So this is and really kind of on as I said the file and not it's um, and I, I just saw Ben chime in there that yes it's uh, the provenance metadata is kind of like the technical um, the technical metadata of the provenance metadata if that makes much sense. Um, but this is what I'm really talking about in terms of um, uh, the metadata about the file that will um, be created um, at the, as a result of this migration process. And so there are two kind of key um, types of metadata um, in, in, in this is the embedded metadata. So basically, what is embedded in the file itself when it's created? Um, and we typically talk about this as file characterization. Um, right now, there are many tools that read this characterization in different ways um, or translate this, this characterization in different ways. Um, and there's a lot of work being done, um, really great work, I should say, um, by BAVAC, um, Dave Rice, the Media Conch, um initiative that's happening uh, thanks to the uh, Performa. And basically, it's to get files to um, a describe themselves because they're they don't always do that, um, and also have it be translated back to you in a way where um, there's a standard um, translation, so you can understand what is in there. Um, what is key about this, and we'll get to this in the QC level, is to make sure it's a one-to-one -one with your analog material to make sure that. Um, uh, in uh, Kate and Jim's uh, presentation. From Wednesday, um, should have referenced this, but in terms of like the PAR and the SAR and the DAR, um, you want to make sure that matches um, your original analog material. You want to make sure that your aspect ratio um, doesn't shift from a 4.3 to a 5.4, for example. Um, you want to—it's just to kind of check that 
um, everything has been done faithfully so that you have a one-to-one -one relationship with the analog and the resulting digital preservation master. And then kind of uh, next to this is the non-embedded metadata. So this is metadata that you're going to either want to um, embed in your in your file if you have the ability to, depending on what type of file um, you determine you want to request, or it's metadata that you want to store next to your file or within your cataloging um, software. And these the types of material that you're wanting to collect in this is the signal path, and I'll kind of talk about this in a little bit, but from what deck and um, what type of cable and what type of connection did you use to what other piece of equipment. Um, so you want to kind of trace how um, the signal that is on the tape got to um, the signal that is now in your digital file um, and store that. Uh, the other thing is the process history, which is kind of tied with that, and that's, um, again, where you're just tracing kind of the environment of capture. Um, there's been a lot of great work um, done in kind of codifying this into a schema, um, and it's uh, REV, R-E-V, um, capital T-M-D, uh, has really done great work in trying to kind of um, make a schema that um, codifies this information in, in an order, orderly way um, so you can capture this and keep this with your file. And then along with this is also, you know, as I said, the creation environment and then also the vendor. Um, if you use a vendor in your migration, any inf key information about them. All right. So it looks like, is everyone still here? It looks like there's some lost audio, but is everyone still with me? Can I get a raise of hands? Yes, okay. Thank you. So let's get into kind of in-house versus vendor migration. Um, and as I said, kind of by doing the steps of um, cataloging and analyzing your collection to determine the, the needs of your collection, um, and then your staffing, budget, and your IT infrastructure will largely dictate um, how you're going to go, um, whether you're going to decide to do it in-house um, or whether you're going to decide to send it out to a vendor to migrate for you. Um, kind of, I'm just going to go over these very quickly and then we're going to dive into these uh, into much more detail as we go along. But with in-house transfers, um, it's a large initial cost um, depending on what type of material you're going to want to migrate um, within your collection. Um, it could be anywhere from ten to thirty thousand dollars to set up a proper um, migration suite. Um, however, that's a one-time cost. Um, there's a low operating cost if um, you have the added benefit of having knowledgeable staff. Um, that once you're up and running, you, you're running. Um, that person can then use that um, uh, suite to then transfer material, um, and there's no additional cost to that. Um, like I said, there is staff required to operate. Um, it's not a huge learning curve, but there is some knowledge that will need to be um, either transferred to them from someone else, um, or they'll need to kind of um, do some training to get up and running to operate this, these type of setups. Um, but the other downside to this is it's slow. Um, essentially, you know you're gonna be going one tape at a time. Um, so if a tape is roughly 60 minutes, um, and with the processes that I describe as we go on, this can translate into you know a two-time runtime uh, transfer. And what I mean by that is you, if your tape is um, one hour, it's going to take you two hours to properly set up and transfer that to a digital file. Um, so this is going to slow down your migration. Um, the way to speed it up is to go with the other option, which is sending this um, material out to a vendor. Um, with it comes a medium to large regular cost. Um, so doing it in-house will be much cheaper to transfer than doing it at a vendor. Um, so the cost will go up. However, the time um, in terms of turnaround um, will be shortened dramatically because the, event, the vendor can accommodate multiple transfers at the same time. They're just set up for this type of um, environment. Um, and also, they have the technical know-how. So if you're staffing, um, you don't have anyone who's really conversant with this material, you can put it in kind of the vendor's hands to do. Um, so like 
we list in the questions here is what type of funding is available to you and the time frame considerations um, may really kind of guide you towards a vendor um, migration plan. So and as I said, I'm not going to drill down too hard into file format um, considerations. We don't want to be too prescriptive here as um, this is actually still kind of evolving. Um, and just considerations to keep in mind are community best practices. Uh, so kind of, you know, um, look on the EMEA listserv, um, talk to other fellow institutions who are doing work of this nature and just see what is their preservation format. Um, you know, there are a lot of people are doing uncompressed wrap disk um, QuickTime.MOVs, um, other are doing uncompressed 10-bit um, wrapped um, as AVI files. Um, it's really just you want to kind of find what works best for you, and this is kind of an evolving process um, with a lot of research being done um, to kind of find the proper wrapper and codec uh, for these kind of preservation material. Um, I should also say that, um, as I said, that with digital, the obsolescence is only speeding up. So this material is going to, once you find, you know, a Kodak wrapper combination that works for you, keep in mind that that may shift in five years and you may be having to migrate it again. So this is, this is what is part and parcel with this type of material. The next is um, institutional computing environment. So basically, what is, what is your institution use um, in, in terms of a computing environment? Um, are you all Mac? Are you all Windows? Um, what does your IT support? What, what kind of file format will you want to um, give to them that they can kind of work with and understand? Um, and finally, and kind of um, most critically, is access. Um, no material is really preserved until it's made accessible. Um, so you want to think about who will you be serving, how will you be serving them, um, which will also help you kind of figure out what type of file formats you want to derive either from your master file. So are you going to be making um, a .mov uncompressed 10-bit and then um, you're going to derive a H.264 um, you know, MK4, MKV file? Um, are you going to be using some sort of uh, streaming service for this material? Um, so you just want to kind of keep those considerations in mind, just kind of talk um, to other people who are doing this in the community at large, because um, there's a lot of great people um, working on this and people are migrating regularly. Um, so the, the, you just have to find what suits um, yourself and your institution best. So before you want to kind of start migrating this material, you're going to want to prioritize. Um, because obviously it's, it can be a Herculean uh, effort uh, and it may be easy to get um, extremely overwhelmed by the amount of material in your collection. So you want to start breaking it down. Um, and ways to do this are um, if you are lucky and you have a homogeneous collection, um, meaning that all you have are VHS tapes, um, what will kind of guide you in kind of in prioritizing the material that you want to migrate is um, the content. Um, so, you know, as we said, is this um, uh, unique to your institution, important to your institution, um, especially relevant to your institution, that that would get bumped up um, in terms of priority as opposed to other things that where you have multiple copies of them, um, no one really knows what's on there, etc. cetera. Um, the other key thing to keep in mind is condition of the material. So is it, is it degrading? Um, is it uh, you know, full of dust, has it been stored improperly for years, um, that will also kind of maybe bump up um, that in terms of your prioritization. So kind of those two things kind of go hand in hand when you're dealing with a collection of um, homogeneous material. When you have a heterogeneous collection, uh, meaning that you have just every format under the sun, what you're then going to want to factor in is format obsolescence. Um, and that's kind of you're looking at um, kind of the earliest formats in your collection to prioritize first because the VTRs or videotape recorders um, that were made to play back that material are either no longer around or they're extremely rare to find. Um, for example, 2-inch uh, was how um, was one of the first um, uh, video um, uh, tape recorders uh, used in broadcast primarily. Um, I think and I, I could be wrong, but I think there's less than 100 of them in North America. 
Um, heads of them are very hard to find. Engineers who are knowledgeable in their operation are incredibly hard to find. So this material would obviously get bumped up um, high in terms of your prioritization um, as opposed to say you have like a, in the previous example all, a bunch of VHS um, tapes where you know you can still find VHS decks. Um, many of us remember using them until recently. Um, so you want to kind of look at the rarer, um, more critically endangered formats first in terms of getting that the signal off of those car carriers. Um, and again, degradation as well goes hand in hand. Um, and so yeah, just to reiterate, you know, homogeneous is when you have all of one format, and heterogeneous is when you have many, many different formats. So inspection. Um, before you kind of start any migration of this material, you're going to want to first um, look at um, the either the reel, if it's an open reel video uh, format, or the um, cassette, um, if it's a cassette-based um, magnetic media format. And what you're looking for is physical deterioration. So is the cassette cracked? Is it, you know, has it been left in the sun that has, has warped? Um, are there signs of mold and partic particulate within the windows? Um, so in the image here, you can see there's a mold infecting throughout the reel of this um, VHS tape. And then are there signs of binder hydrolysis or sticky shed syndrome? Um, this is kind of the, I would say, the uh, most famous degradation of uh, magnetic media where um, the binder and the substrate, there's a layer of adhesive um, that, that binds them together. Um, what happens when binder hydrolysis starts to set in is that moisture um, is absorbed within that um, adhesive and the binder and the substrate separate. Um, and what, what then happens is, is that if you put that into a VTR for playback, um, the head and just because of the mechanical nature of um, you know, video, uh, video playback, um, with that separation from the adhesive, as you're playing it back, you could be effectively erasing it at the same time because you're basically stripping off the magnetic layer of um, the video material. So there are ways to treat it. One of them is to um, basically dehydrate the tape. Um, and there's kind of a low budget way of doing this using food dehydrators, but there's also great work being done by um, Peter Brothers, for example, um, owner of Spec Brothers, um, in terms of kind of getting the moisture out of this, uh, these tapes um, to successfully um, play back and migrate this material. So along with this inspection is just to get an understanding of if any of this material in your collection is particularly at risk or, or rapidly degrading, um, which will speak to your prioritization that you'll want to send this out for treatment um, uh, ASAP. So let's talk about migrating material in-house. Um, and with this, I'll kind of talk about, um, uh, oh, and there's a question. Yes, uh, it's the same method of baking um, that uh, you do with audio in terms of getting rid of um, sticky shed or binder hydrolysis. So migrating material in-house. Um, so what you're going to want to first do is um, set up um, a transfer suite. Um, and what this comes with is um, you need to be you need to purchase this the um, equipment for this. Um, and how this is unique is, you know, a large amount of it you can buy off of B&H or, or Amazon, um, but we're dealing with um, decks and equipment that's, you know, relatively old. Um, and the, while you can find it for cheap, it may not be in good working order. Um, so you want to make sure that you're dealing with reputable um, vendors of this, of this equipment, be it new or used. Um, and again, I recommend, you know, give me a listserv or um, other resources and just kind of asking around because um, it's kind of a I know a guy uh, type situation where you um, can be like I'm looking for you know, say a umatic deck and someone will be like oh there's this guy in California who you know he does great work for me and he's got them um, and then there's also equipment brokerage like broadcast store um, and other places that provide warranties and regular service of this material. Um, so you're going to kind of want to vet um, your vendors of this equipment and where you're kind of sourcing it from. Uh, next to this is installation. So you want um, someone who 
uh, is trained in um, setting up uh, equipment of this nature and is used to setting this up because this is kind of becoming an antiquated um, uh, field to some degree. And you also want to make sure that everything is tested uh, with your signal path um, upon completion of uh, the setup so there aren't any problems along the way um, when you're transferring a tape. And you also want to make sure they document it thoroughly, that you have full schematics, full wiring diagrams, so that if there is a problem going down, problem with a transfer, or you see something as a result of something, you can look to these things as guides to diagnose what's wrong. Um, and that way you kind of kind of take on this information um, and don't become completely dependent on these, these experts. Um, and then finally, you will want to rut routinely maintain this equipment, particularly the VTRs. Um, so you're going to want to find someone experienced um, who can service these things. And as it says here, there's a decreasing number of technicians. Um, so much like the I know a guy um, method of uh, finding this equipment, it's kind of the same thing in terms of servicing it. And uh, typically the same person who sells it to you, um, you will make a lasting relationship with as they'll become your um, main go-to for servicing uh, this equipment as, it's, as it ages. So I'm going to briefly kind of break down different um, video formats here. Oh, I'm sorry, um, uh, signal uh, types. Um, so the the first um, kind of known uh, video signal is known as composite. Um, and what composite is is it transfers both um, the luma and the chroma, which is kind of the main. Uh, information within a video signal. The luma is the black and white information. The chroma chrominance. Um, is the color information. Um, the chrominance only has blue and red. Uh, green is derived uh, via the Pythagorean theorem. And so what composite does is it transmits all of this information at the same time. Uh, it, tie, it ties the luminance and chrominance and various sync um, uh, together um, and transmits it. Um, this is integral to you know two inch, one inch, um, uh, three quarter inch umatic. And basically, this is kind of the foundation of um, uh, television. And um, when we got into kind of recorded analog material, what happened next was there was a separation because with when you send uh, luminance and chrominance together, there's a lot of bleed within the signals, uh, particularly in like reds. If you've ever seen reds that are very saturated, um, CRTs or monitors have a hard time. Um, both recording or displaying it, and the tape has a hard time recording that information. Um, and then also there's a um, known uh, artifact within um, uh, displays is that because of this kind of bleed within the information, there's a, a phenomenon known as um, dot crawl um, that you'll see with color information where it looks like there's dots crawling up the screen, um, and that's a result of this com composite video uh, transmission. Um, so steps were made um, to separate this out. So what happens was the development of YC or S-Video. Um, you'll see this with kind of consumer grade stuff like VHS and Betamax. Um, and if, you have, if you're setting up a transfer receipt like uh, VHS and SVHS, which is super VHS, um, we will have, utilize this YC. So basically the chrominance is separated and the luminance is separated. So the Y stands for the luminance, C is the chrominance. Then as video systems progressed, um, the development of component video um, came into existence where this separates everything out so that you have luminance uh, carried on one channel and then the color information, the B and the, the blue, B or the blue and the R or the red um, are all separated and transmitted separately. Um, so you get complete isolation from each other and you lose this kind of bleed and um, <clears throat> you get far more, um, not resolution, but you get far more detail um, and integrity within um, the transmission of these. And so these you will typically see with um, Betacam and Betacam SP, which became kind of broadcast standards in the late 1980s. Um, and then further on with digital Betacam, uh, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, and so component is um, designated in analog as YPBPR um, or in digital as YCBCR. Um, however, most of you have probably encountered it as YUV. Um, YUV 
is kind of the incorrect, uh, um, I guess, lazy engineer's way of referring to YCBCR. And then finally, you have serial digital interface. Um, and so this standard is still used. Um, and what this is, is a digital way of transmitting video information. Um, how this differs um, from, like, say, DV, um, the DV format, is DV format has, like, a, a, um, a video signal um, or, or, or a, a data stream that you can tap into, that a computer can tap into and read. With Serial Div Digital Inter Interface, or SDI, you don't have that. But what you do have and gain is you have uncompressed, unencrypted digital video. It also transmits um, the audio information. So the, all those previous ones I just cited um, don't factor in the audio at all. Audio is um, transmitted on a, a different signal type. Um, so you get um, audio packaged together with this. Um, and then any ancillary information. Um, so this can be like line 21. Line 21 is um, the closed captioning that's at the top of the video. Um, picture that you don't normally see in an overscan mode, um, and any other kind of um, like time code or things like that um, will be transmitted via SDI. Um, and this stuff um, you'll see with like Betacam and primarily digital Betacam. Um, and I'll kind of talk about it in a little bit, but um, this is a really great way to kind of normalize a setup if you're setting a, an in-house transfer facility. So just kind of to gloss over some workstation configurations, this is a very basic um, uh, workstation configuration. If you, A, have a homogeneous collection, um, and you're just looking to get it done very quickly, um, in, and I, I hesitate to say this, but it's kind of the quick and dirty way um, to get this material off of uh, uh, magnetic um, uh, tape. Um, so here, like you have a VHS deck directed um, directly to an analog to digital or A and D converter, which is then digitized by your computer. There's only one step. Um, here, there's also like a DV, DV cam, HDV. Um, with these formats, because uh, they have a data stream that is um, easily migrated into uh, uh, your computer and it, it understands it, um, you can actually get away with these setups because DV or DV cam or HDV um, we'll connect via um, FireWire, which is actually now um, obsolete, uh, but um, that way you just have a one-to-one -one connection and you're reading and also um, grabbing all of the metadata that is tied within this stream by going via these connections. Uh, if you were to migrate like a DV tape um, uh, through an analog output and then digitize it, you're, you're losing information that's, that's actually within and held within these tapes. So this is kind of an intermediate uh, workstation if you were to decide to do an in-house migration. And I'll just kind of step through what these are, and hopefully the mouse will kind of allow me. Yeah, there we go. Um, so I'll go down here. So these are your BTRs. You have a Betacam deck, a VHS deck, a Umatic deck, and then a DigiBeta deck. Um, and so just imagine a tower um, where all these are. Connected to this is a sync generator. Um, kind of integral to any kind of uh, analog video uh, environment uh, is sync or reference. Um, and what this does is it ties all of these things together um, by sending it the same, sending each of these decks and the time-based corrector and the breakout box and also your analog to digital converter, it sends it the same reference. So they all kind of can, can talk to each other and, and be brought into line with each other. And then if you see here, so the, here's a um, time-based corrector. I'll talk about that and why that's important a little bit. But then you have different signal outputs coming out. So Umatic, typically you'll find Umatics only with composite out. Um, they do did for a time have a YC out, um, but they're pretty hard to find these days. Um, so you can take a composite out with a Betacam SP. You can take a component out. And then with DigiBeta, you can take an SDI out. And the nice thing about this, you know, hypothetical breakout boxes, and there are many different types of these on the market, you can then normalize everything to SDI. So you're only, you only have one signal type between this box and your computer card. So it simplifies everything um, so that you're mainly just switching here for your input. 
and leaving this kind of untouched. And so here is an advanced setup. And so you can see we get a little bit more complex here. And I've kind of not um, talked about um, these two things, which are your monitor and your waveform and vector scope. I'll talk about that and their importance in a second. Um, but here you just see a bit more complexity. We still have the sync generator tying all of our BTRs together. Um, we have a YUV router. So basically, it's just routing everything. It's a YC composite different kind of signal types. And then that's all going into a frame sync. So what happens is, and we'll talk about audio in a second, is because video is running through all of these boxes, um, audio is kind of going straight. Um, and what happens is there's a slight delay so that your audio is slightly behind your video. And so what a frame sync or a frame delay is needed in this setup is that you have to slow down your video ever so slightly so that you remain in perfect sync. Um, I'll show you the audio here. So you can see here that we have the same thing. Um, but just showing the audio, and then we have two channels for each deck, and then it's going out to audio meters, monitors for the two audio channels, um, but there's less complexity here, and so basically it's a shorter path uh, for the audio to travel, and so basically that necessitates the frame sync uh, on your side. Um, these will be available um, you know, after this presentation if you have any other, other questions. This just kind of give you an overview of kind of what goes into these components. Uh, oh, I, I see your question there, Jordan. Um, are you using a frame delay? Hmm. Uh, we, we, let's talk about that at the end because it may be a, a kind of more complex question uh, than we have time for right now. So kind of along with this is um, calibration. So you want to make sure that everything is, um, you know, standardized to a set reference. Um, and this is kind of where your vector scope, waveform monitor, mixers, et cetera, come into play. So I've, I kind of glossed over these earlier, but kind of the ways you look at your video um, are in kind of three, three different uh, views, if you will. Um, you have the CRT, um, which you can see here displaying the, the SMPTE color bars. Um, which stands for a cathode ray, tel uh, cathode ray tube, sorry. Um, and basically, what you want to do, the, the CRT, in my mind, is kind of the, the subjective view of, of your video. Um, and what calibration does is it allows us to kind of set it to a base level um, so that we know what we're looking at um, is the, the monitor isn't doing any, any to, anything to the signal. This is coming from your VTR, your TVC, or something like that. Um, you don't have to worry about um, your monitor showing things incorrectly. And so what we use are standard um, kind of references like the SMPTE color bars. Um, and what that allows us to do is kind of set our, our luminance or our brightness. Um, and if you see that bright um, chip right here, that's your 100 IRE chip um, that basically allows you to be like, okay, that's my brightest um, white. Um, next down is your 80%, which is right here. Um, and then over here are your blacks, um, and these are, it's impossible to see here, but it's got a pluge bar and kind of allows you to see the, the, the gradations in your blacks. And so there's different um, ways to set um, both your luminance and chrominance in here. Um, you strip out, um, it's known as a blue check or something to strip out the chrominance so you can kind of um, make sure your color is uh, represented accurately there. Um, but that being said, the reason I call it a subjective view is I could be colorblind um, and not be able to see, um, you know, the, the red and the green here. So how do I know um, I'm getting, you know, correct representation? I may have, you know, calibrated this um, uh, to the best of my ability. We also use um, 
oscilloscopes, uh, which measure the actual um, voltage coming off of the, uh, the, the VTR and along the signal. And so this is a waveform monitor, and this measures the luminance or the black and white information within the, um, uh, the, the picture. And you can see here, this is actually the same uh, SMPTE uh, color bars, just represented um, with the luminance information. And so right here at 100 IRE, um, which is the measurement, it's a relative measurement of the voltage of the signal, um, is uh, the whitest white. And right here in that Pluge bar that I mentioned earlier, this stair step is the different um, gradations of black, with 7.5 being right here. And then we look at the vector scope, which measures our chrominance. Um, and it looks at the hue. Um, so it's basically, is your color the way it should be looking? Is your sky blue? Is your skin tone accurate? And the saturation, is it is it a muted color or is it a very saturated, bright, vibrant color? And again, this is the same uh, reference bar. And within this reticulate is targets for each color. It's, a, it's essentially a color wheel. Um, and you have, uh, let's see, red, yellow, no, I think yellow, red, uh, blue, green going around. So the other piece of equipment um, that's critical to these setups is a time-based corrector. Um, these can both be um, outboard or, you know, a discrete piece of equipment or built into your deck itself. Um, and what this does is it matches the horizontal and vertical sync of a video signal. Um, all VTRs are inherently dirty um, in terms of the type of video signal it outputs. Um, and this is due to the, the nature of the recording on the analog medium. And so what it needs is something to clean it up a little bit before it then goes on to display or to the CRT. The time-based corrector is what solves it. It kind of strips off and replaces the horizontal and vertical sync information. So it stabilizes the picture. Um, along with this is a, a piece of equipment that's typically built into the time-based corrector known as a processing amplifier or proc amp. And so what this allows you to do is adjust the luminance, the chrominance, and timing of your um, video signal. The reason this is critical and has become more critical um, in kind of this switch from uh, migrating tape to tape to migrating tape to digital is analog media has a very wide window in terms of what um, video material it can capture. You can kind of have a, a, a pretty wide, um, you know, luminance range and a tape should, should take it without losing any information. That's not the case in the digital realm. The digital realm has a very narrow window in which you can kind of shoehorn this analog signal into. So the processing amplifier becomes critical in kind of this, this migration process because what it allows you to do is kind of compress, and, and it's not a real compression, but basically get your levels into the digital window so that everything is faithfully represented on the digital side that is on um, the analog media. So, and then along with this, you also want to calibrate your audio. Um, you know, there's a difference between analog metering and digital metering. It's largely um, due to um, uh, measurement. Um, but basically, on a VU meter or a volume uh, unit, you have a, a 1K sine wave or a 1K tone um, that allows you to set your meters um, to, to make sure that you're monitoring um, your signal accurately off of your VTR. And then you basically just want to find that translation on your digital audio meters. Um, I should also mention, um, uh, just to back up real quick, that um, you also want a set of digital oscilloscopes and monitors uh, when you're migrating everything so that you can see everything um, on the digital side, either measured in um, IREs or a different unit of, or, or millivolts or anything like that, um, and so that you can basically get that one-to-one -one, um, while you're migrating this material. So, and then um, it says here, so along with the SMPTE color bars, um, professionally recorded video cassettes uh, also carry a reference tone, um, which will help, help you set audio levels. So I'm sure many of us are, have seen or um, are familiar with, you know, the SMPTE color bars um, and then being at the heads of tapes. Um, the reason for this is that um, both in, in audio and in video, 
when you what that reference is essentially there for is the capture of the moment of recording. Each kind of setup is unique. So what that tone does is it captures that setup um, with a known reference so that you can then take that tape, come to your own setup, and then um, calibrate it, in, or not calibrate it, but adjust it in such a way um, that you're reproducing the environment of capture. Um, this is, you know, incredibly useful and in incredibly important in terms of migrating this material because then you're, act you're playing it back as faithfully as possible. The problem comes in when those are, um, when the, the, that reference means nothing. Um, so what that, that reference should do is, is then relate um, directly to the content that follows it on the tape. More often than not, or not, I shouldn't say more often than not, but in my experience, um, I have seen that basically that material is laid down, a color bar in reference to is put down because someone thought it needed to be there, but it has no direct correlation to um, the content that follows on the tape. Um, so this needs to be factored in when you're migrating this material that you may be setting up, uh, you know, your processing amplifier um, so that it directly translates into the digital realm. Um, and then you get to the content and everything um, is blown and you're basically clipping um, all of your video information because you've set it to one thing when it actually doesn't actually relate to the, um, to the content of the material. Um, oh, the signal sync generator and the TVC, the signal sync is basically just getting the decks in line. The TVC is, is actually affecting um, the video signal itself. Um, so basically, sync is just making sure every every piece of equipment is kind of in line with each other, um, just to a set reference, um, and then the TBC is then is then um, manipulating the video signal itself. If that makes sense or answers your question. So a typical kind of in-house workflow, um, once you've kind of set up this environment. Um, would be to inspect your material. Um, so is it okay for you to uh, digitize this uh, videotape, um, set your levels, um, and we'll kind of step through kind of each of these things um, as we go along. So in inspection, you want to look for, like I said, uh, your carrier's intactness and functionality. So is the um, Cassette intact, um, are there no, you know, uh, cracks in it? Is the record tab pulled out? Um, things like that to consider. Um, you want to check for signs of mold or, or binder hydrolysis. The way you can um, kind of uh, roughly diagnose binder hydrolysis is by opening the back flap or looking um, at uh, your reel and sniffing it. And <laughs> if it smells like uh, dirty socks or uh, I think it personally smells like crayons, um, there's a good chance that binder hydrolysis has begun to set in. Um, the other way that's a bit more destructive is you can attempt to play it back um, and you hear um, squealing as it's going across the heads. You want to immediately eject that and then you know, set that aside and bump that up in terms of your treatment priority. You then want to look for, you know, is your tape fully rewound? Um, and then also to record any metadata that you may not have recorded uh, already. And then basically, if it's past your, your, your test, um, you want to put it into your VTR and kind of exercise it by um, running it forwards once and then rewinding it entirely. Um, then you want to pull it out, look at your deck, um, go inside and look at the heads and the various cap stands to see if anything is flaked off. Um, if it has, this is another sign that binder hydrolysis has begun to set in. There's some sort of degradation. Um, so you're going to want to pull it out. Um, otherwise, if it's clean, you've re-cleaned your heads, uh, you can prepare to transfer it. So and this is kind of video setup, what I was talking about, where once you've calibrated everything, um, you're going to want to um, basically set a kind of a null setting, so it's a baseline for what you're playing back. Um, and like I said, where, you know, tapes that have reference, but those, that reference actually doesn't mean anything. Setup is when you then go into, you go from your baseline, you've set everything up to the empty barns and tones, then you play back the content, you're like, whoa, things are really crazy in, the, in terms of the signal. I'm going to have to bring down my luminance, 
Um, you know, I got to boost my blacks because they're kind of falling too low. My my hue is um, a little too crazy, um, and that's where you're going to want to perform setup. And this can be kind of a time-consuming process. So, and then you know, with playback, you're going to want to fully monitor it um, and then make any notes of any issues. Um, this is kind of also still being worked out. Um, but thankfully, again, uh, to the Bay Area Video Coalition uh, and the amazing work that they do constantly, um, they have started um, the uh, AV Artifact Atlas. So it's basically defined a controlled vocabulary for these weird things, where it's, you know, is it um, uh, head clog? Um, is there a video dropout? Is this skewing? Is this flagging? Um, various video errors that may happen, and you're kind of searching for a term to describe them. Chances are um, it's already been found and kind of mulled over by some other um, uh, transfer engineer. So now let's get let's let's talk about migrating um, material with a vendor. So if you decide that's kind of the setting up a, a, a transfer suite um, and basically spending all the time to to migrate this material just is not feasible for your institution, you're going to want to go the route of uh, migrating this material. So your first um, order of business is going to be developing a request for proposals. And within this document, um, and I'm only going to kind of um, go through this. We, we're kind of running out of time, so I'm going to go through this quickly. But I will say in the resources um, document, um, there is the uh, guide to crafting an RFP um, that was made by NYU a few years ago um, that really goes into this in depth and will kind of hold your hand along this, this process um, in getting in crafting a good request for proposals um, so that you get good proposals and then how to then um, shape that into, into a, a workflow um, and statement of work. So what you're going to want to do um, with this is you're going to um, demonstrate that you understand the scope of this work and the project timeframes, which you've already gathered in your collection inventory um, and assessment, um, and then also analysis of you know stock lengths, duration, things like that. You're going to want um, you want to describe the the technical capabilities of what you're looking for. Um, like I said, you need to be conversant in kind of these things. You don't need to be an expert, but you need to convey to um, the vendor who's going to be crafting a proposal this, uh, for this that you understand on your side what, it, what it's going to take for them um, to do things. And you want to be very prescriptive in, the, in this. You want to be like, you know, no food or drink within the facility. You, you know, I want you to do full setup for each video migration, things like that. Um, and then finally, you're going to want to have your contact information, uh, the due date of the proposal, um, and kind of your review and response um, uh, time frame and, and, and date for responding. So the criteria for your re reviewing proposals come in are going to be, um, you know, obviously, did the vendor follow the submission process? Because if they didn't, that's, that's an immediate red flag. Um, was the information you requested delivered? Um, how does the cost estimate measure up against your budget? Um, so that's also a, another feasibility thing. If you've got um, X amount of dollars and they say it's going to cost Y amount of dollars that you're going to have to negotiate in some way um, or ask for, for more money. Um, and then will they be able to stick to a timeline? Do they have a demonstrated track record of doing this? Um, and then did they provide references? Be it you can provide them a sample tape. Um, and they can kind of come back to you with that or um, just asking around and vetting them. And I see there's a question here of preferred vetted vendors. Um, I don't think, I can't answer that. I don't think there is. Yes, there we go, the supplier directory. Um, but in terms of vetted, um, I would, again, the EMEA listserv is a great resource. Um, and then just asking the community at large um, and people you may know within EMEA or just around of vendors they have used and had good experiences with. Um, so as a result of this RFP and the kind of response process, what then comes out of it is if you've invested the amount of time to really work out your workflow and uh, timeline is you can then strip out of that RFP a statement of work or SOW. Um, and this gives you a very clear kind of guideline for both your um, 
role and tasks in the migration process and the vendors. Um, it can basically serve as a contract between the two of you. So if um, they do something that you don't agree with or, or um, vice versa you do, you can point to this document and be like, okay, you're in breach of you know this. So finally, um, we have the QA and QC procedure. Um, and quality, it's basically quality assurance and quality control. Um, and the way I like to think of these things is quality assurance are things that you have uh, been per, um, prescriptive with with the vendor. So it's basically, like I said, like no food or drink in the facility. You're going to do this. You're going to have this person watch this. I want no pieces of equipment in the signal path that don't are unnecessary to the migration of this. It's um, you being very descriptive of how you want this project, pro uh, apologies, project to, to um, go forward or be completed, I'm sorry. Um, quality control is something that you perform. Um, it's when you get the deliverables, deliverables back, it's a way for you to check to make sure everything has um, been done correctly. You're looking at it both in terms of um, fixity or the files, um, the same ones that uh, the, the vendor created. Um, and then you look at the um, visual information through a visual assessment and does it look good to you? Is it um, faithful to the original? So a QA procedure um, is basically like, you know, communication of the packing and delivery methods. So basically, um, how are you going to pack them? What are you going to be sending? Are you going to be sending hard drives for um, the material to be put on, the material the vendor is going to create to be put on? Um, how are you going to deliver them? Will they be sent overnight? Will they be sent, um, you know, via ground, um, et cetera? And then you basically want to prescribe to them your full file naming and delivery method, and this will be, you know, case by case with every institution. Um, but will you want them to name them in a specific way, put them in a uh, specific directory structure, et cetera? Um, fixity is really key. Like I mentioned, that chain of custody with the UUID. Fixity is really the start of that in terms of um, with the digital file that by requiring your vendor to um, record some sort of checksum upon the um, moment of creation. So they um, you know, migrate this, uh, analog tape and they create a QuickTime, they should run a MD5 or SHA-256 checksum on that uh, file and either, you know, put it as a sidecar and spreadsheet, um, however you wish them to do that. And then that way when that returns to you, you can then validate all of those checksums to make sure that, yep, that's exactly what they created, nothing has changed. Um, like I, I, I know at least this is what they created on there and nothing has changed in transport. Um, and then that kind of checksum value will carry on within your institutional infrastructure and repository um, as kind of a, a, a signature or, um, of that file to make sure it is what it is. Um, and then detailed workflow for video migration is basically, as I, as I kind of keep saying, is just from start to finish how you want them to do this project. Um, just so you can be very prescriptive and be like, I want you, you know, all materials should be stored like this. There should only be one person, you know, they should be using gloves when they're handling the material, um, putting it into a VTR, just kind of examples of, of being very, very uh, prescriptive in terms of what you lay out in terms of uh, the workflow for the vendor. Um, you know, they may bristle at this um, because they obviously run a business and know how to do that. Um, so there's obviously a middle ground to be reached, but it's, it's just very good to be proactive about this. Um, and again, the prescribed requirements for the environment and staff of just what um, you expect them to do. And then QC procedures. Um, what you want to do on your end is have a proper assessment environment. You don't necessarily need to have, you know, a full transfer suite like we described earlier, um, but you want to have some sort of known um, way to uh, assess these files, um, be it a computer with um, some sort of software to look at this stuff or um, a computer with an analog to digital converter that will send it out to a CRT monitor um, so you can see it um, faithfully because um, all of this material, um, all, yeah, all of this material because it's uh, standard definition is primarily what I'm talking about, uh, is interlaced. Um, television and most broadcasts now is progressive. Um, interlaced means that um, 
uh, instead of discrete frames like film, uh, where it's 24 frames per second, um, it's fields. So when we talk about, say, 2997 for NTSC, you're actually getting an A and B field instead of a discrete frame due to the bandwidth of the transmission. And um, the CRT is built for that. And basically through our persistence of vision, we don't really um, see that, um, but it's key in terms of analyzing this material. And then there's a uh, visual assessment. So how um, are you gonna, is this, do you have a small amount of material that you can watch fully um, and have someone kind of document and record any errors they see? Or is it just a mountain of material and you basically are gonna have to do spot checks because um, it's just impossible for you to have the time or the staffing to go through with such a fine tooth comb uh, and look at everything. Um, and then the technical assessments, like I said, fixity is, is incredibly important uh, with this material. Um, and then file characteristics, like I said, you wanna make sure that what was created um, is well formed, um, that things are documented either within the file itself or next to the file. And, uh, and I see uh, Red Open QC tools, which I will get to in one second. Um, and then this is just a sample uh, media info uh, output, media info um, and the work that Jerome and, and Dave Rice are doing um, is fantastic. And um, we're just getting more and more, um, so media info just kind of out of the box. There's a GUI version and then um, I highly recommend using it in the command line. You can kind of drill down deeper and deeper into your file um, and expose kind of um, better translations is kind of the best way um, to, 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 to think about it looking at the hex and then kind of giving you a readout of that, um, but to make sure that these files are well formed and are what you are, um, you asked for. And then finally, QC tools, which is another amazing tool that Dave Rice and uh, the Bay Area Video Co Coalition have uh, developed. Um, and what I try to show here is when you put a video file um, in here, it gives you this graphical readout using um, various filters within FFmpeg that just show differentials in terms of um, like uh, pixel differentials. So it'll kind of help you identify dropout or kind of key areas in the video picture where things seem to have gone amiss. Um, and then you also have this viewer where it'll give you two side-by-side -side views and you can kind of toggle through um, various uh, um, filters and, and waveform monitors and, and different ways to look at the video um, to see if everything was, was, was accurate. Um, so it's a great software tool that allows you to kind of um, look at this material without necessitating, you know, spending $10,000 to get a, a proper environment. So wrapping up, um, essentially, um, you know, it's really up to you about what, um, how you want to go in house is uh, you know a, a a large upfront but um, pretty minimal cost but obviously it takes um, a great amount of time to migrate this material so if you have a collection that's you know um, small to medium but requires really kind of um, um, time intensive uh, care um, like a fine arts collection for example um, you may want to go with in house um, if you just have mountains and mountains of uh, analog media in your collection um, and you don't really have someone on staff um, who uh, is capable of um, migrating this material um, or you just are operating under a grant and you need to get this done quickly, um, then a vendor um, is probably the way you're going to want to go. But it's really kind of up to you um, uh, about um, um, which, which to go with. Um, so yeah, so though, wrapping up, um, hopefully this gave you kind of an uh, understanding of, of the different processes in kind of analog to digital migration um, and kind of, I don't know, some sort of grounding um, to carry out a project on your own. And please feel free, my email is here to drop me a line if you have any questions. And I think we have a little time for questions if you have any uh, right now. Yes, thank you so much, Peter, for what a really informative and packed session. Um, there's a lot of great information in there. Um, I want to give folks a few minutes who maybe are typing questions to get those in. We have um, about five minutes left um, in our time today, and Peter's uh, email is up there for you all now for follow-up questions.
one question, um, perhaps I'll throw out at you, Peter, while we wait for others, right. is thinking about um, your quality control process. Um, QC tools and MDQC, um, those are really great tools that have emerged um, in recent months and year. Um, I'm wondering if you also recommend kind of playback and spot checking, doing a visual um, check of files that are received from a vendor as well? Uh, oh yeah, yeah. I mean, like I'm just speaking uh, from the institution, where, like our workflow here, um, we'll kind of we kind of go from uh, technical and characteristics to visual. Um, so we'll kind of look at the file, um, make sure the fixity is verified, um, then look at the technical characteristics to make sure that all um, is good, and then uh, we'll visually watch it. Um, and you can do that within QC tools, obviously, um, but we also do it. You know, we have a um, CRT if it's a standard um, uh, definite dish, bleh, apologies standard definition piece, um, and then also oscilloscopes to look at it. But I think, yeah, spot checking or, or full view, um, you need to visually look at it as well. Okay, uh, great. A um, we'll couple of questions have popped up. Recommend for capturing closed caption track data. Um, I actually don't know uh, for closed caption uh, track data from VHS tapes. Um, I would actually... Um, I would post that to the Amiga listserv. Um, yeah, I, I've not had any experience with that. I just, I, I can just jump into Molly. I know you yeah, had yeah. this question the other day as well. Um, at NYU, we are considering this. Um, we're going to be doing some writing. Um, we're currently doing a lot of research on this process, but of course, line 21. If you're capturing uncompressed, the closed captioning signal is in there. We're just um, figuring out how to uh, make. Uh, access copies available with that information, whether it's an SRT sidecar um, and then producing DVDs or how we're really going to go about that. But if you're capturing uncompressed, then you are maintaining um, that track data from a VHS tape. Um, I think there's a question from Rob. Yeah. So for, yeah, that's a kind of a catch-22. Um, I. I, I don't know. Um, I, I I really think you would just have to you would have to migrate it um, because if you don't know, um, there's no way you're gonna know without migrating it. So it's kind of um, you know I don't know how you would prioritize that, but um, that's the only way. Um, and then Elizabeth uh, for TMS, if you want to shoot me an email, I can't. Um, Obviously, some things are sensitive in terms of what I can share, um, but I'd be happy to kind of show you what we've done um, with with it um, over here. Great, and yeah, that question was in regards to TMS and uh, yes. and your configuration at MoMA. Okay. Yep. Great. Um, well, this this session, of course, has been recorded, and you'll receive an email with the link to how you'll be able to access that file um, after our session today. The materials that um, Peter prepared include, oh, I'm sorry, we also have upcoming webinars I should, I should announce right now. Um, next week, we're going to be having uh, the final, we have three webinars left in this series, two dealing with um, film formats, so looking at um, uh, film formats for digital transfer, and then for workflows um, on Thursday. So that's Tuesday the 13th, and then Thursday the 15th, um, and then the following week we're going to have the final session on digital storage and infrastructure, and all those dates are up there for you now. Hope you'll be able to join us for our third, I mean for our three final sessions. Um, the materials that uh, Peter uh, shared with me today include the presentation that we all went through together. This, a PDF of this presentation is in your materials tab, as is the resources uh, PDF. So um, thank you so much, Peter. This is a really wonderful session. Um, oh, my pleasure. Thank and, you. Yeah. Um, I don't see any other questions I wanted to give folks couple minutes to type. Um, but we'll, we'll look forward to reaching out to you if, if people have questions after today or perhaps when they re review the materials or the recording, um, you can get in touch at that point. So on behalf of the Association of Moving Image Archivists, Online Continuing Education Task Force, which is such a mouthful, I um, <laughs> want to um, 
thank you so much, Peter Alexic, for joining us today. Um, and I think that the one last comment up here about a oh, yeah. You know, contract. Yeah. Yeah, I would actually uh, I would point them to the at the NYU um, RFP because I think there is some language in there. So I'd look at the resources yeah. document, or if you, or shoot me an email, I can I can send you an example. Yeah. It's digitizing video for the long term. It was published by New York University in 2013, and it's on the resources list. So there are some samples in there. Um, but thank you so much, Peter. This was a lot of fun. And um, yeah, we'll look thanks. forward to folks joining us uh, again next week. So at this point, we will officially sign off. Thanks, Peter. <laughs> See you guys.